All right, so this lecture will be part two of the membrane dynamics and transport. Uh, we already touched base. We looked at simple diffusion and we looked at osmosis. Okay, simple diffusion, those small lipophilic, those small nonpolar molecules that can zip through. Um, some polar molecules that are small, like water, can come through. All right, and then we talked about how water moves, what drives osmosis, and where water will go, and why that's important. So now we're going to move on. There are molecules that are charged. There are molecules that are polar that can't make them way directly through the membrane. So we're going to begin with those and talk about characteristics of what we call um, uh, facilitated diffusion and active transport are the two ways to get smaller molecules through. And then at the end, we will talk about how the cell gets big stuff in by using the vesicles okay, to either bring stuff in or secrete stuff out of the cell, but bigger items. Okay, so let's get started. We'll uh, look at our map here where we're headed for and you can see we're going to be doing protein mediated protein mediated transport so remember these molecules can't go directly through the membrane they cannot do simple diffusion they're charged they're polar maybe a little bit larger so they need proteins okay they need either channels or transporters to that span the membrane so say here's the membrane, All right? These proteins are going to span the membrane that will allow it to, for these molecules to move through those proteins. Okay, so protein mediated. Okay, we'll start with facilitated diffusion and then we'll look at active transport and we'll divide active transport into primary and secondary okay so we'll look at this first at the end we're going to head here to the big stuff but let's first look at smaller charged or um, smaller polar molecules how they get through and first we'll go with facilitated diffusion and you can see the difference between this one here and this one here these two here the active transfers versus facilitated diffusion. Remember, whenever you see diffusion, you're thinking passive transport, because what is the driving force for diffusion? There must be a concentration gradient. Molecules move from high to low concentration. We'll see the cell sometimes wants to move stuff from low to high concentration, so against the concentration gradient, right? Diffusion. Molecules move from high to low. What if we have to go from low to high? That is when the cell has to use energy, and that's when we get the active transport. Okay, but we're first going to talk about the passive process facilitated diffusion. Okay, very similar to simple diffusion. The only difference really is, is that in this case for facilitated, facilitated meaning we're being facilitated by using these membrane proteins All right, so just what I talked about facilitated it's passive because the molecules are moving down the gradient from high to low active transport when the cells need to move molecules from low to high and move it what we call against or up the concentration gradient then the cell has to use some form of energy to make that take place. And that's why we call it active transport. Active in meaning energy is being used by the cell to make this process take place. So what are the proteins? We've looked at some of the, we've looked at proteins and their functions. Hey, what we're fo focusing on today or this lecture is membrane transporters, right? These transporters are, I'll draw it again, are basically embedded, whoops, through the membrane, okay? I know, my drawings are, my drawings are bad in class, so 
and then they're even worse here drawing with this little mouse so but this is your membrane these are your proteins in which these molecules can move through okay and we're going to see these membrane transporters we got two main classes we got channel proteins so small stuff small stuff ions okay really small ion very small stuff can move through channel proteins the other thing about channel proteins is channel proteins can only do facilitated diffusion facilitated diffusion can take place through channel proteins okay there's carrier proteins we're going to see they can change their conformation carrier proteins on the other hand can do both facil uh, facilitated diffusion and the active transport okay and then on our channel proteins again we'll break them down to some of the channels are open all the time and some have to be cued to be open and those are the gated channels we got mechanically gated voltage gated chemically gated and we'll talk about what those cues are in just a bit all right so again we're working on first we'll look at the proteins we'll then we'll look at facilitated diffusion and then we'll look into active transport okay so let's look at these proteins and the difference so channels channels are like this they're like a door that's open door all right if they're open channels the door is always open if they are gated channels the door can be closed and we need a cue to open up the door okay but as you can see there is basically they're like a tunnel or a door that opens up and so the outside has access to the inside okay they're never closed off from one another if the channels are open there's access from outside to inside or inside to outside okay they're like little tunnels or passageways directly linking the outside of the cell with the inside of the cell this allows for rapid movement okay if you open a channel things can move in but there's no way to force a molecule out force one in and the only thing that can be used for these are very small molecules so what are small like our ions or sodium so we'll see a lot of ion channels okay potassium those are things that have channels in which they allow water has water small it has what's called aquaporins which are channels even though water can go through the membrane it's slower if there's a channel for water the water can move through very quickly the thing is is that there's no way for the cell to force these molecules in anywhere, force them in. So what must one have to use a channel? There has to be a concentration gradient. Only facilitated diffusion, only diffusion can take place through channels. So you must have a concentration gradient to utilize the channels. Okay. Whereas for carriers, you can see they are set up a little bit different than the channels. They change their shape. They change their conformation. When a protein changes shapes, changing what's called its conformation. You can see carrier proteins. They're more like this rotating door. Okay, when the rotating door, when this, when this is over, whoops, let me get the when this portion of the door is open here it's open to the outside but not the inside when it rotates in now it's open to the inside but not the outside so there's no direct link like we have with the channels okay carrier proteins closed off to the outside molecule binds and we can move now we change conformation and the molecule can move out in our channels or sorry in our carriers okay. in our carriers we can do both facilitated diffusion and active transport 
okay because in the carriers what must happen the molecule must bind to the carrier right it doesn't just move just doesn't hang out in here and then channel changes conformation and moves out it has to bind whereas the channels they just move directly through in or out of the channels okay the other thing with carriers is remember channels we had small molecules ions and so forth bigger molecules like glucose glucose has six carbons right six oxygen so it's a bigger molecule to do facilitated diffusion we must use channels with these bigger molecules so that's why we have two things that can do facilitated diffusion channels can do it with small ions carriers can do it with bigger molecules also carriers can do active transport they're going to be able to move molecules from low to high so against the gradient that's when we're going to have to use energy from the cell to make that take place okay but carriers can do both facilitated diffusion with usually with bigger molecules and they can um, use uh, active transport we will see there are some carriers that use ions and those are ones doing active transport we're going to see one channel and i'm just going to mention it not channel carrier now is the sodium potassium pump okay you're going to want to get this one down sodium potassium pump is one of the main character main carriers in the body and we will be talking about it throughout the semester okay but keep that in mind start talking carriers because that is going to be one of the biggies okay but that is the main differences between the channels and the so let's take a look at a uh, closer look at the channel proteins here Remember they have they allow access between the outside and the inside of the cell they're kind of like those open doors or a door that opens okay the other thing to realize on channel proteins is that they're usually specific um, there's sodium ion channels uh, potassium ion channels so they're usually specific um, one ion maybe a couple ions so usually they're not non-specific where everything can just come in okay so these regions here are usually lined with certain amino acids because remember these are proteins and there's some interactions that don't allow certain things in but um, the thing that it's specific for is allowed through the channel okay again channel proteins they must have a concentration gradient because only facilitated diffusion can take place so they must have a concentration gradient in which the molecules are moving from high to low the other thing is is we talked there are open channels these are channels that are always open okay. so if there is a gradient then say there's high sodium out here low sodium in here sodium will keep moving through because the channel is open it allows it through there are channels that are gated okay. they are closed there must be a cue that causes the channels to open up Okay, some of these cues are chemically gated. Okay, chemically gated, like neurotransmitters, we're going to see can open up certain channels. Um, even hormones can open up certain channels. There are channels that are voltage gated. We're going to be talking about these when we talk about the nervous system and how it operates. It's a change. Usually the cell is uh, higher voltage outside compared to inside the voltage inside the cell is negative compared to outside and if we change that voltage that can open up channels and then mechanically gated stretch on the membrane can open these gated channels and we're going to see these this a lot in the sensory nervous system okay so there's open channels always open gated channels they need a cue and then they open up and what other what ion they're specific for or ions then they're allowed to come in but again channels must there must be a concentration gradient 
because if sodium is equal here and sodium concentration C, these two are the same, right? There's no driving force for diffusion because we're at equilibrium. Okay, so there always has to be a concentration gradient. So we already talked mechanically gated. This is just looking many of our sensory receptors, voltage gated neuron, and chemically gated uh, neurotransmitter receptors. Okay, but we'll get into those more specifically for now. Just realize there are gated channels that what their cues are, you don't know have to know specifically, just realize there are mechanically gated, voltage gated, and chemically gated at this point. We'll get into the specifics when we get into those specific uh, body systems. Okay. All right, now let's look at characteristics of carrier proteins. Remember, carriers can do facilitated diffusion or they can do active transport. Just like the channels, the carriers are also specific to certain molecules. Only certain molecules can come in here and bind. Again, that's the difference between channels and carriers is that the molecules and carriers, they have to bind to physically bind to the carrier. That's why you can see these are proteins. That's why we have to have that three dimensional sh shape. So that region, that binding region is specific for that molecule. Okay. Unlike the channels, carriers don't open up to both at the same time. They change conformation. So here we're open to the outside. Now we're open to the inside. Okay. When we look, carriers can take on different types. We can have a uniport, uniport meaning one, in which only one molecule is moving through the channel. Or the carriers can be, or sorry, not the channel, the carrier here. Co-transporters, in which the carriers move more than one molecule. And that can be further broken down into symport and antiport. Symport meaning both molecules go in the same direction. Here both molecules are being pushed out of the cell and the other the molecules are being or can also be going into the cell but they're both going in the same direction. Where antiport the molecules go in opposite direction. Okay, here sodium I'm going to label this as ECF because this is to keep you give you guys a heads up sodium's being brought out potassium's being brought into the cell i mentioned one protein that or transporter that you guys will definitely want to know this is the famous sodium potassium pump okay sodium potassium pump is key to many many fit things going on in our body and we're going to see it throughout the semester so make sure you realize sodium potassium pump and what it does it's bringing sodium out it actually brings three sodium molecules out to every two potassium molecules it brings into the cell okay but it's an example of an antiport because the molecules are going in opposite directions So let's look first, now that we have the channels down and the carriers down, their properties, let's first look at facilitated diffusion. Remember, both of them can do facilitated diffusion. Ion channels, or channels can do facilitated diffusion, carriers can do um, facilitated diffusion. Usually ion channels are gonna be small things, facilitated diffusion with a little bit bigger molecules, we're going to need to utilize carrier proteins. Okay. But unlike simple, simple diffusion was this here. This is an example of simple diffusion. 
Okay, simple diffusion. Basically, the molecules can move directly through the membrane. Here we're looking at facilitated diffusion. And again, facilitated diffusion can take place between a um, through a channel or through a carrier. Here's an example of a channel, and here's an example of moving through a carrier. Remember, the molecule has to bind in the carrier. In the channel, it just moves through that pore in the channel. Okay, but what is the key? We see the word diffusion. What must we have? We must have a concentration gradient. We have to have high in one region, low in the other, because that is the driving force. That means that the the cell does not require any energy to do it. It is in that kinetic energy of that concentration gradient in those molecules. Okay, they're moving down their concentration gradients. Okay, so facilitated diffusion. Got to use a protein because the molecule is either charged or um, polar. We must have a concentration gradient because we're doing diffusion and it can be used either channel or carriers. Okay. Here's kind of giving, here's giving you a little bit, showing you the difference between the carrier or the channel. Remember the channel, molecule just moves through. This is showing you how the molecule has to bind to a carrier for this to operate. Okay, we're open to the extracellular fluid, the molecule moves in, binds to the carrier, and what happens? The carrier now changes conformation. Okay, changes conformation and the molecule moves into the cell. Okay, this is facilitated diffusion. There must be high of this molecule in, outside and low of this molecule inside because we're diffusion the process is moving in a line or moving with the concentration or down the concentration gradient an example of this is a glute transporter Okay, glucose moves down its concentration gradient. Lots of glucose. You just ate a bunch of sugar. Okay, you ate a bag of Skittles, and now you have all this glucose in your blood, and that glucose moves in to the interstitial fluid. Now you have all this glucose outside and very little glucose inside. What do you see taking place? We got these glute transporters, and you see it moves two molecules come in and have to bind two glucose molecules bind and then we get that conformational change and glucose can move into the cell. All right, but again, facilitated diffusion because high outside, low inside. Okay, no need of energy from the cell to make this take place. So now let's move on. We've done facilitated diffusion. Now we're gonna do active transport. We got primary and secondary active transport. We'll look at the difference between these, but what the active is telling you is the cell has to use energy. Why does it have to use energy? Because what are we doing in diffusion? We're going from high to low concentration. The molecules moving from high to low. Many times the cells need to move molecules from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Okay. To do that, we can't use diffusion, right? Because we're going against the concentration gradient. So the cell has to use some kind of energy to make that take place, right? And depending on what form of energy it uses, depends on whether it is primary or secondary active transport. But since we're moving from low to high, this is creating concentration gradient, right? We're creating a gradient or maintaining a gradient 
a concentration gradient because we're moving the molecule. We're not allowing the molecule to diffuse in and equilibrate. We're doing the opposite. We're making it high in one region and low in the other. Okay, and we'll see how this operates here in just a second. So let's look at this active transport and the properties of it and what it actually accomplishes. Um, so we've seen this portion. We've seen the passive transport. Now we're over here on active transport. Again, it's protein mediated, just like facilitated diffusion. But the difference is, is we're going against the concentration gradient, not down the concentration gradient and, or with the concentration gradient like we do with passive transport. We're going up or against the concentration gradient. Okay, we're going from area of low concentration to an area of higher concentration. So what's this actually accomplish? Why would the cell want to do this? Remember, it creates a concentration gradient. You remember those kind of graphs, those bar graphs we showed you? There was high sodium outside and very low sodium inside. How do you think that's accomplished? Yeah, it's accomplished by doing active transport. We're constantly, the cells are constantly pu pumping out sodium. And so that keeps sodium low inside the cell and sodium high outside the cell. So we're making these concentration gradients by do, using this active transport. We'll see we, later on these concentration gradients we can use as energies. There's stored energy in the gradients because those molecules want to go from high to low. Okay, but that is what we're doing in active transfer. We are creating concentration gradients. We're creating that state of disequilibrium. High sodium outside, low sodium inside, and the opposite for potassium. By using the sodium potassium pump, we're keeping potassium high inside and potassium low outside. Okay. must have input requires energy input but from the cell okay so in terms atp we haven't gone through our uh, cellular respiration but atp is our energy store so we have to use our form of energy we'll see it requires this atp um, we will see there's a difference between primary and secondary active transport one uses atp directly one uses atp indirectly but we'll look at those differences here in just a bit but just realize that it requires energy to do from the cell to do active transport all right so let's look at the types of active transport we said there's primary and secondary active transport primary also known as direct because we're directly using atp to make this as the energy and secondary we or indirect because we're not using ATP directly. We're actually using the concentration gradients that sodium or that ATP is used to make those to make those concentration gradients. Okay, so let's look first here at our example of primary active transport and realize ATP ATP we have to make ATP. Our cells have to make ATP to store energy. So when we go to ATP to ADP, we are using that stored up energy in the ATP molecule. So this is using energy right here, this ATP to ADP. Okay. So here we're directly, the transporter is directly using ATP and what's it doing? It's taking X from an area of low concentration and pushing it into an area of high concentration, going against the concentration gradient. Okay. So this is primary active transport. Now, secondary active transport, secondary active transport is going to be taking place through this protein here. All right, what you got to realize and through the semester is that there is potential energy in those concentration gradients. We can use that potential energy to do work. So we have the same protein here. 
ATP to ADP, we're moving X from high, or sorry, from low to high. So we have this high concentration of X here. So X would want to go back in. There is a stored energy in this gradient because X wants to move through there. Okay. So this, again, this is this example here. This is primary active transport. The secondary active transporter here, look what's taking place. X is going through this transporter, but in this case, X is going from high to low. All right, it's going with its gradient. But what's taking place with our molecule S? S is going from low to high. So secondary active transport is using the energy in that stored gradient of X to move molecule S against its concentration gradient. So again, this is dependent on ATP because we wouldn't have this gradient if this primary active transport wasn't making the gradient, but we're not using ATP directly. It, we're using the potential energy stored in this concentration gradient of X to move S. So that is where we're getting the energy. Okay, so they're both using energy. It's just what form? Are we using ATP directly or basically indirectly by using the concentration gradient that ATP set up? Okay, or the using of ATP set up. Right? So these are important concepts. We're going to be seeing these concepts throughout the semester. Okay, I've already mentioned the sodium potassium pump numerous times. About 30, the calories you eat, about 30% of the calories you eat go towards fueling your sodium potassium pump throughout your body. So almost a third of your calories are used for sodium potassium pump. So you can see how important this transporter is okay we're using it to make these gradients we're going to see we're going to many of your secondary active transporters they utilize sodium they use a, utilize a sodium concentration gradient to fuel them all right so how do we set that up with the sodium potassium pump so very important you can see here are some examples of primary active transport the one i've been harping on you about you see it comes first in line here sodium potassium pump um, calcium atpase okay you'll see that sodium potassium pump or atpase okay using atp Okay, let's so if you see ATPase, you know it's primary active transport. Here's that calcium ATPase. It's uniport, it's only moving calcium, but look what's taking place. We got calcium. Calcium is low here. And we're moving calcium to an area of high concentration of calcium. Okay, we're using an ATP to make that take place. Therefore, it is ATPase or pump, you could say, in that this is primary active transport. Here is our sodium potassium pump. Okay, found through all animal cells right primary active transport because we are using ATP and this is what's maintaining we saw those charts with sodium high outside and sodium low inside and potassium high inside and potassium low outside it doesn't show it here but the ratios for every sodium, three sodiums are moved out to every two potassiums moved in. Okay, but it is an ATPase in that it is using this energy, that ATP, to move these 
molecules a con cross their concentration gradient. This allows sodium, and we will see many of the secondary active transports use this concentration gradient of sodium that is set up by the sodium potassium pump. So without the sodium potassium pump operating, many of these secondary active transporters that we'll look at in a sec are not going to be able to function because there won't be any energy to fuel the movement of the molecules. It's an antiport. And like I said before, about 30%, almost a third of your energy ATP produced by the cells is going to be used to fuel the sodium potassium pump. Don't worry about wall band, but wall band's a drug that that blocks the sodium potassium pump. You can imagine that would cause some serious problems in your body if you had you ingested a bunch of wall band. In my lab I was working at, I came across a canister of this. I was like, stay away. I don't want any part of this wall band because you get that in your system and you're going to have some serious problems because you're shutting down the sodium potassium pump. Okay, but here's it in action, starting here at one. Okay, three sodiums bind. ATP allows for the conformational change, and now the sodium can be released. Okay, now on, from the outside, potassium binds. Okay, cleave off the phosphorylation and it opens up we get a conformational change and now those two potassiums can move inside the cell so sodium out potassium in and it's a three to two ratio okay and what each time this happens one molecule of atp is being utilized okay And the roles we've already discussed creates this disequilibrium. We're going to see sodium potassium pump plays a part in what we call the resting membrane potential, which we'll discuss when we get into um, into neuro or sorry into uh, the nervous system. Uh, your book handles resting membrane potential in this chapter, chapter five. I will cover it when we start getting into the nervous system. When we start going there, all right. Keeps that gradient. Those gradient, that sodium gradient, is going to be used to fuel many of the secondary active transport. Okay, the sodium gradient is the energy, the potential energy from the sodium gradient is what's being used to move those other molecules in those secondary active transport. Okay, cell volume. I won't get much into that, but you can see this this pump is very important for the operation of our cells. And here's that example. You can see our secondary active transport. We got symport and antiports, but which molecule do you see throughout sodium dependent transporters? Many, many, many of those secondary active transports are fueled by that sodium gradient, concentration gradient. You got one down here with the peptide symporter. Okay, so you can see that sodium potassium pump sets up for these transporters to be able to operate. So you can see how important it is to set up these concentration gradients by using the sodium potassium pump. Like we said, it depends on the primary active transport. It depends on that sodium potassium pump, which is a primary active transporter, because that primary active transport is what sets up 
that concentration gradient of sodium. Just the nail, the nail in the coffin here to give you looking at your here's a sodium potassium pump, right? Sodium's going from low to high, potassium's going from low to high. We're using ATP. This is primary active transport. Right? Here's our secondary active transport. In this case, we're using an example of symport. Okay. Symport meaning both molecules are going in the same direction. Here we're using sodiums going down its concentration gradient. The energy stored in this gradient is being used to move molecule X from low to high. They're both going in the same direction, so symport, right? Secondary active transport, again, we're using sodium gradient, but in this case, it is an antiport because the sodium's going in and we're moving Y from low to high out. We're going in opposite directions. Okay, but you can see both the antiport uh, transporter and the symport transporter are using the sodium gradient. It's just moving the other molecule, the molecule that's going from low to high, in a different direction. Okay. An example. Okay, an example of sodium SLGT of secondary active transport, sodium glucose, sodium glucose okay, transporter. Well, glucose, GL. Sodium glucose transporter. You can see here. Sodium binds to the carrier, glucose binds, and what's moving? We get the conformational change when sodium binds, and now glucose can move out. Okay, should should be two here, showing two sodiums here, two sodiums coming in. All right, what kind of transport is this? I already said secondary, but is this antiport or symport? What we got? Yeah, they're both moving in the same direction, so it is a symporter. The SLGT, sodium glucose transporter, is a symport transport since the molecules are moving in the same direction. Let's look at some properties of carrier carrier mediated transport. Okay, for both passive and active carriers. Okay, because remember the molecules have to bind in the carriers. That differs from the channel proteins. In the channel proteins, the molecules just move through the pore. Where the carriers, they must bind. So this gives us some characteristics. One of those is specificity. Okay, specificity in that a carrier moves only one molecule or a similar group of molecules. Okay, it doesn't move. So, carrier is not going to move glucose and also move amino acids. It may move glucose and galactose or another um, carbohydrate, but it's not going to move all these different molecules it's specific for a certain molecule or a group of molecules. They exhibit competition. So if we have a a um, transporter that moves a group of molecules, you can see that taking place here. Here is glucose concentration going up on the x on the y. We're looking at how much glucose transport. What's the rate of glucose transport? When glucose is the only one there, it shows this curve but if we add galactose to the mix what do you see happening to the glucose transport and yeah, the galactose is because remember 
in a carrier, the molecule has to bind. So if galactose is bound in the carrier, glucose cannot bind also. So it slows down the rate of transport because we have binding with our carriers. And then saturation. Okay, this comes into play as you see the concentration of whatever the transporter is moving. Here's the rate of transport here. You can see it goes up as the concentration goes up for that molecule, the transport goes up, but at a certain point, it plateaus. And why is that? There's a certain a finite amount of transporters. At a certain point, you have such high concentrations that the molecules are bound. All the other molecules have to wait for that molecule to be transported before they can bind and be transported themselves. So we get this phenomenon called saturation. Okay. Okay. Here, we're not saturated. Okay. We're able to keep binding the molecules and moving them, but at a certain concentration, all the carriers are bound. No other molecules can move in until those molecules are brought into the cell and then they open up again and now these molecules so we get this saturation effect all right so we've gone through simple diffusion okay, facilitated diffusion our passive transport okay, secondary primary act of transport and then we got endocytosis, exocytosis, and phagocytosis to go through. This is, we brought in through diffusion, through the channels, we were able to bring in small ions. Through our carriers, we're able to bring in some bigger molecules like glucose. But what if we have to bring in something big? Okay, we have to use a different process. We got to use these vesicle membrane-bound vesicles to do endocytosis, bringing in exocytosis and phagocytosis, another way of bringing in large materials into the cell. Okay, but as you can see, all these processes here also require energy from the cells. So looking at this movement of larger molecules through using what we call vesicles, basically these vesicles are these bubble-like plasma membranes that wrap around whatever contents in the middle of it. Okay, And they're going to be what either send material out or bring material in. Okay, So we're going to have an interaction with the plasma membrane in this regard. Okay. Two basic process import large molecules, endocytosis and phagocytosis. Uh, we're going to look at endocytosis here in just a sec. Phagocytosis we'll touch on when we get to the immune system um, because the only cells that do phagocytosis are those of the immune system. All right. To get material out, large material out, we use exocytosis. So let's look at this process of endocytosis. It requires energy. You can see there is this pinching off of the plasma membrane. Many times this endocytosis is receptor mediated. It's not just initiated by any molecule. It needs a proper ligand, proper binding. A certain specific molecule binds to the receptor and that such the process of this endocytosis that causes the lining of these pits with clathrin that help initiate the pinching off of this plasma membrane. Okay, you can see the plasma membrane gets pinched and now the material gets trapped in this vesicle. And in this case we got the re receptor and the ligands, right? The receptors dislodge or the ligands leave the receptor and now we can pinch off and cause the receptors here and the ligands in their own 
endosome or vesicle. Okay, so that's the process. We get first binding that results in a clathrin coating the pits and then the pinching off of the plasma membrane into this vesicle. And then we get the pinching off of the material and the receptors we'll see can actually be exocytose brought to the membrane and brought out to sit on the membrane. Things like protein hormones, growth hormones, antibiotics, plasma proteins, carriers can be brought in through this endocytosis. So on the opposite is basically exocytosis. You can see now these receptors are in a vesicle. Eventually these receptacles or vesicles can dock with the plasma membrane, fuse, and then fuse in and become part of the plasma membrane. This is initiated. This is accomplished through proteins called RABs and snares. They help dock the vesicle and cause the fusion and of the vesicle with the membrane. You will see besides receptors, as we see here, there many neurotransmitters, many times neurotransmitters are in vesicles sitting waiting to be released. Hormones, uh, hormone insulin sits in a vesicle in those pancreatic cells and when it gets initiated will fuse and then the hormone can be released. Okay, we'll see later on. We'll look at this kind of docking with the snares and so forth when we look at neurotransmitter release. Those neurotransmitters that are sitting in vesicles, when they're cued, they get released, but the signal for it is going to be a calcium signal. But we'll get into more of this signaling with the snares and the rads when we look at release of the neurotransmitters. Okay, just realize exocytosis, we need proteins, rabs and snare proteins to help fuse and dock and that will cause the exocytosis. All right, so our epithelial, our epithelial, those are our cells, our epithelial line, our body or our lumens, our tracts in our system. And so they are basically at the forefront between the external world and the body. They are that transition. Okay, some, if something wants to come in the body, it has to go through epithelial. If it wants to leave the body, it goes through epithelial cells. Okay, so let's look at one of those. So you can imagine that these cells, they have to be able to diffuse, cause fusion, or be involved in transport, what we're talking about now. All right, we need to transport materials across these cells. Now, can we do this? We can use it. Membrane transporter channels. We use a combination of uh, active transport and passive transport to move materials from the outside, say through our digestive tract, or move stuff from inside to outside through our urinary tract. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the cells that line these tracts to form our transporting epithelium. If you remember epithelial cells, epithelial cells have very little extracellular fluid between them. Their cell packed to next to another cell packed to next another cell. Right? In transporting, if we were going through our digestive tract, do we want just anything to pass through into our body? And yeah, we want to try to keep the bad stuff out and bring the good stuff in. So our epithelial, they are tightly together and they have these tight junctions and that would limit materials from just passing right through. So in this case with these tight junctions here material would have to come through the epithelial cells and the epithelial cells can limit what actually comes through by transporting only say the good stuff. 
And if you remember, there are two sides. There's an apical side. That's the side that faces the lumen. This would, if this is the digestive system, this would be the digestive tract, and the basal side, which faces the body. Once we make it through here, we can get into the bloodstream. And so we can see that our cells are polarized from the apical to the basal side, and this allows us for movement through this transporting epithelium. Okay, we can get absorption. Absorption is the movement from the lumen into the extracellular fluid into the body, or from the extracellular fluid out. That would be secretion. Okay, this is taking place, say, the digestive tract, we get absorption. In the urinary tract, we want to move like waste products out into the tubules of the nephrons of the kidneys so we can eventually excrete that material. Okay, so these epithelials are important in this transport, either into the cell or out of the, into the body or out of the body. And it can take place if there's no tight junctions, we can, okay, spaces between the cell, we can get para, paracellular movement, right? But you can see it limited to very, very small things. But what we're looking at is transcellular pathway through the cells. How can movement take place through these transporting epithelial cells? Okay. You see it's a combination of active and passive transport, what we just finished talking about. And so we're going to look at an example of this. So let's look at how these transporting epithelial uh, use active and passive transport to basically move, say, in this case, glucose from the lumen of the kidney back into the body because we don't want to lose glucose we eat our glucose i mean in these same times we might want to lose glucose because we eat so much of it but in, in the old days when we had a little bit of food we wouldn't want to lose our glucose in our urine so our body has a way of when the glucose is filtered out to bring it back in so let's look at how these cells are able to do this let's have talk to your neighbor um, you don't have any neighbors now in classroom, so um, let's walk this through. But I, your professor really likes this slide because it kind of makes you deduct and makes you use the knowledge that you just learned to figure out what is actually taking place. Because what do we know? What are the differences between how could you figure out what type of transport are taking place at these different proteins? on this cell okay we got to look at concentration gradients right concentration gradients are going to tell us which way is it active or is it passive transport right is it moving through a membrane there's a difference between simple and um, membrane or, or transport or uh, channel so protein media transport and so is ATP being used so what kind, you know, is that primary or active transport? So those are the things we can look for to kind of deduce on what's taking place here. Okay, so look at glucose. Glucose is low here. Glucose is high here. So what are we doing with glucose? We're moving glucose from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So what's that tell us? That is this passive or active transport? Now what is sodium doing through this protein? Okay. Sodium's moving from high to low. Okay. What kind of is this a symport or an antiport? So what kind of transport is this? Would it be facilitated, secondary, or primary active transport? Now we're looking at glucose is high here, and we're moving it through this protein to an area of low concentration. So we're going from high to low glucose. 
So what's this tell you? This facilitated diffusion, secondary act of transport, primary act of transport. And then finally here, we see sodium coming through, okay, leaving the cell, and potassium's being brought into the cell. It's not showing potassium here, but what we see here is sodium's going from low to high, and it does show you you're using ATP. So what kind of transport is being used here? And what, what what do you think, where is, on this, where do you think um, potassium's low and potassium's high? Okay, and can you tell me what the name of this protein is? Okay. Well, these questions, you can be, should be able to deduce what these questions are um, by looking at and using the knowledge that you just learned from this lecture. All right, so that is it for this. I know it's been long, but the chemistry and the membrane transport, I do spend a good amount of time in because these are important concepts that you guys will be using throughout the semester. So I want to make sure you're understanding them. All right.